everybody. It's lovely to be here. Lovely to hear about all the work you all are doing. So I am, of course, really pleased to talk about my new book today to all of you, because especially because this story actually begins in Mumbai. Uh, uh, you must forgive me for the course of this talk. I will still refer to it as Bombay because, you know, just to keep the period setting going, um, which is I sort of outlined that in my book as well. Period names for all all cities. Uh, so let's let's begin this. Um, let me just share my screen. One second. Bear with me. Right. So I'm going to begin today's talk with uh, a small quote from one of Arthur Conan Doyle's own books. Uh, this is from uh, The Adventure of the Copper Beaches, and uh, of course Holmes and Watson are off on their adventure and they are going by train and as they go out they are looking at the countryside and Watson remarks uh, to, uh, to Holmes and he says, but look at all those lonely houses, each in its own fields, filled for the most part with poor ignorant folk who know little of the law. Think of the deeds of hellish cruelty, the hidden wickedness which may go on year in, year out in such places, and none the wiser. The scene described by Holmes could be set in the village of Great Worley in Staffordshire, except of course, what happened in this village was for real. So who is the mystery lawyer of, uh, of this title? <clears throat> and what happened in this village of Great Worley? Well, his name is George Idalji. He was a 28 year old lawyer who lived in the village of uh, Great Worley and his father was the vicar of, of, the, uh, of the church in Great Worley. So, sorry, this doesn't seem to be moving. Ah, here we are. <clears throat> so this is the vicarage of Great Worley where George used to live. And this is St. Mary's church where his father was the vicar. Now, his father's name is Shapurji Edalji, and um, this is Shapurji. He had arrived from Bombay. He was a Parsi who converted to Christianity and left for England, and he became the first vicar of South Asian origin in, uh, in England. So we'll go into you know, what happened to Shapurji as well. But before I just go into this family in the vicarage, I want to explain, I mean, all of you in Bombay, of course, know who Parsis are, but this is just a little background. Now, Shapurji is born in a Parsi family. Uh, Parsis, as you all know, were Zoroastrians from Persia who fled uh, for the Arab invasion in the seventh century AD. They settled in the port areas of Bombay and Karachi, and uh, they were called Parsis because they had come from Persia. Now they were enterprising, they learned the local language Gujarati, and uh, they very quickly prospered uh, in business because they became wealthy, westernized. Um, uh, they worked closely with officials of the East India Company in opium and textile trade. And um, you know, here they are in their, um, their Parsi traditional dress and uh, they became pretty wealthy and very soon very westernized as well. Uh, they made a name in business and in politics. Uh, so just for background, the first Asian MP elected in Britain uh, was a Parsi. And of course, I'm sure all of you know the name. It's Dadabhai Naroji. He's elected in 1892 and uh, he was elected for uh, the Liberal Party. Of course, he was known in India as the Grand Old Man of India. Uh, and this is his portrait, which hangs at the National Liberal Club in London. Uh, now, um, it's interesting that all three Indian MPs before independence uh, <clears throat> in the UK were all Parsis. So he was followed by another Parsi um, and Mancharji Bhavnagari and a third Parsi called Shapurji Saklatwala. Uh, and all three of them came from Bombay. Now, um, Shapurji, uh, Shapurji Edalji, who is the father of George, he went to his background is that he goes to, um, of course, sorry, um, as you all know, the Tatas they were also very big in business. So here we have the Tata family who are still big in the UK. They own Land Rover and Jaguar. And um, well, we're back to Bombay where um, Shapurji Adalji 
uh, attended. He came from a wealthy family. He was sent by his father to the elite Elphinstone College. And uh, of course, his father thought that he would you know, study law like most people did. Uh, but Shapurji was going to go a different way because wealthy westernized Parsis were actually seen as, um, as a very potential target for conversion. So this is what started happening is that they were, you know, uh, Reverend John Wilson, he, he sort of wooed all these Parsis. And as a teenager, Shapuji already starts developing a real interest in Christian texts. He starts smuggling them to his house because his family disapprove and he starts reading them. He's very influenced. And um, finally, because his family start objecting, he actually runs away. He, he lives in Kolaba, he runs away uh, from his family house. He lands up at the door of Reverend Wilson and he says, baptize me. Um, so in 1857, he is actually baptized in the Amroli church in Bombay. And uh, he's just 15 years old. He makes this passionate speech where he says that he has now been civilized. Now, of course, his family had rejected him. So Shapurji travels around initially in Maharashtra, working uh, you know, with tribals, trying to get them to convert to Christianity. But he always wanted to go to England and study uh, to be a curate. So he's very, he's very intelligent, he's very canny. He actually writes a dictionary of Parsi to English, uh, Gujarati to English dictionary. And this sells very well. So he, um, with the proceeds, with the royalties, he buys a ticket and he leaves for England. So he lands up at Canterbury. Now for the next 10 years, he goes around from city to city in England and uh, he, he gets his first curacy in, uh, in Burford, a small town just near Oxford. Um, and it's when he travels to Liverpool that he meets uh, a young white woman called Charlotte and they fall in love and they get married. Now Charlotte's family is also very interesting because she is uh, married to, uh, sorry, she is the daughter of a vicar and she comes from a church family. So her father is a vicar, her uncle is a vicar, and it actually proves quite useful uh, for Shapuji because um, the uncle uh, is the vicar of Great Worley and he's about to retire. So he just hands over this, uh, uh, you know, this uh, church to Shapuji. He does a favor for his niece and her new husband. And that is how the family land up in this little village of Great Worley where they start their life. Um, and he becomes the first South Asian vicar in England. Um, within a few months of their arrival, their first child is born. He is George Adalji. He is, um, well, the subject of our book. Um, two more children are born and they are photographed on Easter day uh, in 1892. So here they are. This is Shapurji, his wife, Charlotte. This is George. And uh, here's his younger brother, Horace, Sister Maud. Now, you can imagine, this is 1892. When he becomes the vicar, it's 1876. Victoria is in, you know, on the throne. The empire is at its height. Here we have a brown man preaching the word of God to an entirely white parish. Well, of course, it's a recipe for disaster. So very quickly, the family at the vicarage finds that they are not welcome. And one day, Shakuji finds graffiti outside the vicarage. So somebody has painted, the Idalgis are wicked outside his house. Well, he just wipes it away and thinks nothing of it. But then they start receiving these anonymous letters. And these letters are just notes. They are left, I'll show you a few. So here they are, this is what they look like. Um, some of them uh, is written in a sort of child's handwriting. Some have crude sketches, as you can see in this one, for your bloody father, Reverend S. Edalji. And they're abusive, they're threatening. Um, he's very troubled, he's very worried. He calls the police and they come in, they look at everybody um, and they make an arrest. Uh, they actually arrest the maid. Uh, she's 17 years old. Her name is Elizabeth Foster. They compare her handwriting with this handwriting and they say she's the one who's done it. So Elizabeth is marched off to the police station. 
Now at the police station, her, her lawyer says that if she is tried, she's very young, it's going to ruin her life. So he sort of asks the vicar to forgive um, Elizabeth. Now the vicar is a, you know, he's a kind hearted man. He says, of course, and he forgives her. He hopes that, you know, he's put it into this chapter, they can now move forward. But Elizabeth, while she is leaving um, the police station, swears that she is innocent and she swears that she's going to have revenge on the Idalji family. So it's quiet for barely a few weeks and the anonymous letters start again. And you can see these letters now. It's like revenge written loud on them. And they are now getting really very, very aggressive. They are threatening the vicar. They're threatening George. Um, and they're saying, you're going to see your son dead. I mean, imagine him, imagine what he was feeling receiving these letters. Imagine how frightened these children would have been. And um, there are also hoaxes at this time. So suddenly letters are going out on behalf of, you know, sort of allegedly written by Shapuji to traders in the area saying, I need tiles for the roof. So a cartload of tiles arrive. And of course, he doesn't need those tiles. There's nothing wrong with his roof. So he has to send them back. Or even worse, a letter goes to the doctor saying, uh, Mrs. Idalji is very ill and you know, come quickly. So a doctor comes rushing and finds there's nothing wrong with Charlotte Idalji. Everything's fine at the vicarage. And it just leaves Shapuji really embarrassed. You know, somebody he knows is just trying to harass him, trying to embarrass him, and he doesn't know what to do. He, of course, goes to, he goes to the police again. He writes a letter in the newspaper saying, um, you know, please check with me before you send things. Because by now, coals, you know, whole carriages full of coals are arriving and he hasn't ordered them. They're being offloaded outside the vicarage. So all sorts of things are going on. He goes to the policeman, to the police station, and he says, you know, I'm just being harassed. But the policeman, you know, the head in charge of this little village at this time is um, Sergeant Upton. And Sergeant Upton, for some reason, thinks that this, all this that is happening is being done by George. So he is, he is immediately suspicious. Now, George is a very, um, he's a very quiet, uh, shy boy. He's a bit awkward. He doesn't have too many friends. And he is... Um, he has myopia, so he has slightly bulging eyes. So Upton is convinced that is this odd looking boy is behind uh, what's going on. And uh, meanwhile, of course, these anonymous notes continue. And you can see they're just, some of them are just scraps of paper left outside the vicarage. And this one says, uh, your mother, and it's a beggar woman holding a child. And, you know, so on, it just goes on. This is uh, another one, it says, is Mr. Dalji a bigger fool than he looks? And the anonymous letter writer, who's quite maniacal at this stage, I think, he writes, my name is God Satan. So these letters just carry on. And again, the police, Charlotte, the police are doing nothing. Um, uh, you know, Charlotte, the children, they're all frightened. George, George is actually growing up slowly. And you know, this is the environment he's growing up in. Here's another one saying, pig, I'm a dangerous man, give me five pounds. So, you know, they're extortionate as well. Now, George by now has, uh, you know, some months and years have passed and George has now started going to secondary school. So here he is as a teenager. He's very studious, he's good in his studies. He's got admission into a very good grammar school. It's called the Rugli Grammar School. Every day he takes the train and he goes to Rugli, uh, traveling on the same coach with him. Are lots of other schoolboys going to other schools. They're all rowdy, but um, George sort of keeps to himself. And then suddenly a very odd thing happens. There is a key, a large key is found outside the vicarage. And Sergeant Upton, of course, is called in again and given the key. And Sergeant Upton, as usual, once again, thinks that it's George who's done it. And he thinks that this key belongs to Rugli Grammar School, where George is a pupil. Now, as it turns out, the key doesn't belong to Rugli Grammar School. It belongs to Walsall Grammar School, which is a school six miles away. Now, what earthly reason would George have to walk six miles 
to Walsall Grammar School, steal a key, bring it to the vicarage, put it outside the door. I mean, it made absolutely no sense. But then Sergeant Upton wasn't looking for logic. He was convinced that this young boy has done it. And that's it. And what's worse is he now writes to, he makes a full detailed report and he sends it to the chief of Staffordshire Police, uh, Captain Anson. So though nobody is found to be guilty of stealing this, no conviction takes place, suddenly what happens is that George comes under the radar of the Staffordshire Police. So his case is now sent to George, uh, to uh, Captain Anson. And Captain Anson, a little background to him, he is an imperialist to the core. He's an aristocrat. He lives in a huge country estate. His uh, ancestors have been part of the East India Company. And one ancestor has won the Victoria Cross in the, you know, in the mutiny. His house is full of treasures from China. And of course, he intensely dislikes the brown man who is the vicar of Great Worthy. He thinks there is no reason why this Indian man should be there teaching to a white parish. And of course, he believes everything his Sergeant Upton has said. And he's convinced that this George is the one who's writing all this, all these letters causing all the mischief. And what's worse, he thinks the vicar is actually lying to save his own son. He's also very contemptuous of Charlotte because a white woman has married a black man. And, um, you know, that is frowned upon as letting down the side, you know, you're supposed to breed for empire, not, not uh, you know, have mixed race children. So this is the background to Anson. Now, Shapurji hears that Anson is convinced uh, that, you know, George has done, the, done this deed. So he writes to Anson, he's very angry. He writes to Anson, he says, come to the vicarage. He sends him a map of the vicarage. He says, come and see how the vicarage is laid out. But of course, Anson can't be bothered. He just, um, he is convinced this is it. And the letter writer carries on. He, as I said, he seems to be quite a maniac. One day he comes and deposits 72 objects outside the house. It's, uh, you know, things like bootlaces, lumps of coal and old purse. By now the family are so fed up. Uh, they don't even go to the police because they say, if you go to the police, they're just going to say George stole all these things. So they just let it pass. And then suddenly in 1895, all this torrent of abuse, the anonymous letters, everything stops. It's as if, you know, the person has he left the village. What has happened? Why is he stopped? Anyway, family breathe freely for some time. You know, after a long time, they, they have a breathing space. George by now, of course, has grown up. He's, he is a, a graduate. He has graduated in law. He's done very well. He's got a high second class degree. He has a bronze, uh, cert bronze medal, several certificates. He's got a job in a law firm in uh, Birmingham where he starts practicing. He frames all his certificates, puts them up on the wall. And uh, here we have a picture of the young, young, jo young George. He takes his train to Birmingham every day. And uh, he's quite enthusiastic. He even writes a book. It's about railway law for the commuters. Um, uh, and uh, here's the book, Railway Law. It's called The Man in the Train. Uh, sells for two pence. It's reviewed in the papers. And George is very proud that he's a writer. Remember, his father had also written this uh, Gujarati to English dictionary. So it sort of runs in the family. And um, Iralji family are sort of breathing easy after many years, thinking, OK, life's on track. But of course, that is short lived. Because in 1903, the village of Great Worley was going to have, you know, a, a disaster was going to strike. It was going to be the scene of a series of mutilations. And these are animal mutilations. Somebody was coming in the dead of night and slashing horses and cattle and sheep and leaving them to die in the field. It was gruesome, it was scary. And you know, the villagers are absolutely terrified. The farmers lock up their cattle. Uh, they don't let the, the children go out after dark. Um, the newspapers cover this story. And um, Worley is described as the village of fear. 
The police are around, they're combing the area, there's a visible presence, but they cannot catch the killer. It's the same pattern. He comes every night, dead of night, slashes these animals and leaves them to die in the field. So, you know, people from surrounding areas come. These are, this is an image of the workmen who are next to a cart and they carry these corpses of horses, you know, mutilated horses away on these carts. And I'm not going to show any uh, horrible pictures of mutilated horses, but what happened is people started flocking to the village to photograph, you know, the obsession with the macabre and the gruesome continued and um, they, they converted them into postcards. So it actually um, put Great Worley, this tiny little mining village on the map. And it was described as the village of fear but uh, people started talking about the Whirly Ripper. And it's just a few years after London had been terrorized by Jack the Ripper. So, you know, there is this real fear. And what happens when there is fear and the police can't find anybody, you know, it's going on for six months. Of course, the rumors start circulating. And um, who do you suspect when, you know, rumors start multiplying? The only odd family in this village, it is, the vicar, the brown vicar with his mixed race children and his white wife who keep to themselves. And then things take another sinister turn. Once again, these anonymous letters start arriving. And this time they are directed at the police. So the police start receiving anonymous letters which threaten the police. And the police start receiving anonymous letters which say that there is a gang operating and the leader of this gang is George Edalji. So once again, George's name has come up under the radar of the police and they start watching the vicarage. Now, George, of course, is somebody who has nothing to do with animals. It is, he lives a very ordinary life. He, every day he catches the 745 train, he goes to Birmingham, he catches the same train in the evening and he comes back uh, and he's a very lonely man. As I'd said, he's very quiet. Uh, he doesn't have too many friends. So he doesn't go to the ale, uh, you know, to have a drink. He doesn't go to the pub with his mates after work, join them for, a, for an ale. He didn't drink. Um, all he used to do was go on walks. And as the rumors in this, you know, sort of magnify in this village, these walks turn into prowling in the dark you know, as they multiply. So George is being watched by the police. And now Sergeant Upton, remember Sergeant Upton? Well, he has been fired over the years because of drunkenness at work. So he is off and he has been replaced by Inspector Campbell. Now Campbell, of course, inherits the same prejudices as Sergeant Upton. So he himself is also watching George and the vicarage is being watched. But six months have gone. They haven't found a killer. The village is terrorized. Anonymous letters are circulating. Rumors are floating. Police don't know what to do. So on August, in August, August 18th, when a, car, when a horse is found slashed about just half a mile from the vicarage, the police move in. They go in and they arrest George. So here's Campbell, he's very pleased. They go to Birmingham, they arrest George, and um, then they go to the Vicarage and they remove a coat, which they say has horses on it. They take away a pair of boots, which they say is muddy, and then an eraser, which they say has a spot of blood on it. Um, and George is locked up in Birmingham jail. Here he is, this is his, you know, the mugshot they take from the police. He looks terrified. And um, well, the point is, George says that uh, this is the coat they have uh, is not one that he ever wear, wore outdoors. It was a very old coat that he only wore in the house and in the grounds of his house. He said that he had not stepped out that whole night. It was a rainy night. He had five witnesses who would say he was in the house after nine o'clock that evening about the muddy boots. He said, yes, he had come back. It was a wet day. He had stepped in a puddle. There was water on the boots. And as for the razor, he said he never used a razor. He used to go to the barber for a shave. So 
But of course, um, Inspector Campbell isn't interested in George's denials. He's locked him up. The case goes to court and there is a trial set in Stafford. Now, everybody comes, the crowds come pouring in to look at this, um, for this trial. They come to stare and to look, you know, see who is this person, this evil person who has mutilated cattle for six months. And the women come wearing, you know, carrying large picnic baskets for a day in court, uh, wearing large hats. The press come. Um, there is like a jostle to get the seats in this uh, in this little uh, courtroom because it's also such an important case has been sent to a tiny courtroom and a lower court. Um, anyway, and the press coverage, of course, starts. So I'm just going to read a few extracts which show how prejudiced they are. And of course, all the press coverage revolves around George and his looks and his ethnic origins. So the Daily Gazette writes, about his swarthy face with its full dark eyes, prominent mouth and small round chin. His appearance is essentially oriental in its stolidity, no sign of emotion escaping beyond a faint smile. Now many believed at this time that Parsis who worshiped the fire and the sun regularly carried out nocturnal sacrifices of animals. Now, of course, this is all nonsense, but this is, remember, a small mining village. They've been fed on a few stories of Kipling. They've, you know, heard of the mutiny. They've heard of the Thuggy cult, or where, you know, the sacrifices were made by the Thuggies to, uh, to Kali. They've got everything mixed up, all their religions mixed up, and uh, they're convinced that Parsis, you know, do these nocturnal sacrifices. Um, so, Poor George Adalji, you know, born and born in Great Worley, baptized in this church, uh, and still regarded as a man with a strange religion and a foreigner in this village. So the Daily Mail writes, those who have closely studied this extraordinary criminal in the dock would have no doubt that he is a degenerate of the worst type. His jaw and mouth are those of a man of very debased life. Edalji has also gained for himself the reputation of being a lover of mystery, another oriental trait, and one that goes far to explain the anonymous letters. So here we have the court scenes going on. Um, as I said, it was a really crowded courtroom and uh, it took um, just 50 minutes for them to sentence George and find him guilty. Uh, the press are there in full force, as you can see here, they are the journalists. Uh, the Birmingham Gazette writes, the explanation of the choice is probably to be found in the circumstances that Adalji is of Eastern extraction. The subtle Eastern mind loves a mystery and is vain. So George is found guilty and he is sentenced to seven years penal servitude. Of course, the news devastates his parents, Shapuji and Charlotte. And here is Shapuji. He looks so worn. I mean, he is just a man in his 40s. He looks, he looks absolutely scarred. This man, he left, he left India, his hometown, and he thought he was coming to a land of civilization. And then he's he has racist attacks against him. And now his son is in jail, his very brilliant uh, lawyer son. So he's, he's really, really uh, devastated, but he is a man of real courage. He doesn't give up. So he starts a campaign. He starts a petition, he and his wife, uh, collecting signatures, supporting George and saying this was a miscarriage of justice. He even brings out a little leaflet, um, the case of George Adalji, miscarriage of justice. And he says it was one of the most painful things for him to write. Um, and of course, all this, uh, all the, you know, the reports on the trial have got the attention of a few uh, legal experts who say that, you know, this looks like a real case of miscarriage of justice. So there is a momentum building and they write letters to the editor. Um, they um, send a petition to the home office with, as I said, 10,000 signatures of very worthy people, you know, his old teachers, other lawyers, and everyone says we have never seen George Adalji hurt anybody. This is not in his nature. This is a flawed trial. And the Home Office reacts. All of a sudden, three years later, George is released. He is uh, 
out on bay, uh, on parole. And um, he, but of course, he still has, you know, he's still guilty of the charge and he's been struck off the solicitor's role. So there's nothing he can do. He can't practice. He is so scared. He can't even go back to um, Great Worley. He's, he goes to London because he says that if I go to Great Worley and another cattle is, you know, another horse is, uh, is slayed, then they'll put me in jail again. So he remains in London. He has no fee, no money. And he does what he thinks he should do. He then incredibly picks up his pen and he writes to the most famous writer of the day. Now, George had, while in jail, he'd been reading uh, the novels of Arthur Conan Doyle. And he thinks that only Arthur Conan Doyle, the creator, you know, this is one of the articles he writes himself that he is innocent. He thinks that Arthur Conan Doyle, the creator of Sherlock Holmes, is the only person who can save him. He says, so he writes to him saying, only you can clear my name. Only you wearing the hat of Sherlock Holmes can do this. So a little background as to what happens when this letter comes through the door of Arthur Conan Doyle's house. Now, it is a period in Arthur Conan Doyle's life when he's actually feeling really low. His wife of several years, Louise, had just died a few months back. But it isn't just her death that he's mourning. He's also wrapped by guilt because while he was caring for Louise for 13 years, he fell in love. He fell in love with a young, very dynamic woman called Jean Leckie. And now he was free to marry Jean. So he's, he has this feeling of guilt that, you know, did I wish that Louise would die so I was free to marry Jean, so he has all these conflicting ideas and he is in a very dark space. And suddenly this letter arrives and he writes himself that it was a welcome distraction because suddenly here was a cause. Here was somebody who had been wronged and um, here was a miscarriage of justice and uh, somebody who was, you know, taking up the cause for somebody who's downtrodden is something he felt he would like to do. So he throws himself into it. He says, I'm going to take up this case. And remember, it's the only case that Arthur Conan Doyle investigates personally. So he's going to do the whole thing. He invites uh, George to meet him. First of all, he wants to meet him. So he calls him to um, the Grand Hotel in Charing Cross. And uh, well, George arrives. And George arrives early, he's sitting there and Arthur Conan Doyle is delayed, but he reaches the hotel and he looks around. And of course he recognizes George instantly because George is the only Indian in the room. And he's sitting there and reading a newspaper and he's holding it really close to his face. And Arthur Conan Doyle just stands near the door and observes him. And just like his fictional detective, Sherlock Holmes, who uses his powers of deduction before he's you know, even said a word uh, in, the, in the process. He just uh, deduces, he knows instinctively that George is innocent because he says he's severely myopic. There is no way he could have crossed those fields in the dead of night on a stormy night because the night of August 18th was dark and stormy, um, crossed the fields, and slashed animals. So already, just like his fictional detective, he has deduced that George is innocent. So he meets him and he says, uh, and of course he introduces himself and he says that he'd like to take up the case. And he asks him whether his myopia was actually brought up in the trial and George says, no. So Arthur Conan Doyle is onto the case and suddenly the press, you know, they are so fickle the minute they learn that Conan Doyle is going to, Sherlock Holmes is going to investigate this case, they turn. Suddenly, you know, all this talk of the debased jaw and the Oriental <clears throat> is gone. Suddenly, everyone's on George's side. So um, Arthur Conan Doyle, of course, begins his investigation. He has to go to the scene of the crime. He goes there. So one day on a cold January, 1907, um, Arthur Conan Doyle takes the morning train from London to Birmingham, and then he changes trains at Birmingham. He takes the branch line to Great Worley. 
He walks to the vicarage and he is greeted by Charlotte and Shapurji. Uh, they you know, <clears throat> welcome him and he has breakfast with them and he hears their story. And for the first time, he hears from them how they have been oppressed all these years, all the racism they have uh, had to face, the anonymous letters. Now, none of this was brought up in the trial. So nobody knows, you know, in the outer world, knows about what had happened to this Adalji family. So Arthur Conan Doyle is really sympathetic. Um, after that, he goes to the field, he checks out the soil, he talks to villagers, he goes to the local pub, he chats with the villagers, and finally, he then goes and calls on um, Captain Anson, because he has to talk to the police chief. And he meets Anson, and this meeting with Anson <laughs> immediately convinces him that Anson is racist, and that his racial prejudice is what really, you know, made him convict uh, George. So, well, armed with all this knowledge, <clears throat> uh, Arthur Conan Doyle, <clears throat> excuse me, he goes back. <clears throat> Sorry. He goes back to London and he does what he promised. So he writes in the Daily Telegraph. <clears throat> he writes an article and it is spread, as you can see, over all the columns of the newspaper. In January 1907, the case for Mr. George Idalji. Special investigation by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. And this article causes a sensation because it's also carried across the Atlantic. So the New York Times reproduced copies, the Washington Post reproduced copies. George, whose photograph is in, uh, in the article, becomes famous. Everybody from New York get to know him, all across England get to know him, and everybody champions his cause now. Other, you know, other authors like Bram Stoker um, and um, uh, George Bernard Shaw, they start praising Arthur Conan Doyle for what he's done and for championing the cause of George Adalji and fighting this miscarriage of justice. So um, both George and, uh, of course, Arthur Conan Doyle. Is, is, George is getting famous. Arthur Conan Doyle is becoming a real hero for championing his cause. And of course, he now, um, what does he write in these articles? So, he, um, well, first he says that England soon rang with the wrongs of George Adalji. Everybody's talking about this case. So much so that Jawaharlal Nehru, who was um, a young student in Harrow at the time, uh, is reading about it too. And he writes to his father, Motilal Nehru, and he says, there is no doubt that, you know, this man uh, was, uh, became a victim because he was Indian. So, you know, it's affected everybody. I'm sure there was a lot of reaction in Bombay as well when, you know, they heard this news of George Adalji. Uh, so what, what does uh, Arthur Conan Doyle do in his articles? He takes up with forensic precision. He examines the details of the case and the law, you know, the trial. He takes up all the evidence that was presented, the coat with the horse hairs, the boots, the razor, and he throws them all out. He says not one of these things could have even, should have been even admitted as evidence, leave alone used to secure a conviction. So he throws out everything. And then he goes a step ahead. Because what had not been revealed at the trial was George's myopia. So he has all these independent uh, ophthalmologists who test George's eyes, and they testify that somebody with such poor eyesight could not have crossed these fields at night. So he has that. And then he has one more thing to say, and that is about the, um, uh, the what had happened to the Adalji family over the years, from when George was a child, the whole history of the anonymous letters, suddenly these are out in the press and you know everybody knows what had happened here. And he doesn't even stop there. He then compares it to the Dreyfus affair, which happened in France, in Paris. So the Dreyfus affair is, um, it's a very famous affair, a uh, very famous case. Um, where this Jewish army officer called uh, Dreyfus is charged with selling military secrets to the Germans. And he's arrested, tried, arrested, and uh, uh, imprisoned. But 
soon the police discovered that it was the, so the secrets were actually sold by a Frenchman, uh, but they tried to cover up the case. So it leads to uh, you know, a real scandal and a police cover up. And uh, it led to you know, the famous writer, Emile Zola, writing an open letter saying, j'accuse, I accuse um, you, know, you of anti-Semitism. So Arthur Conan Doyle compares the Dreyfus affair and he said, that sordid Dreyfus affair. The English were so um, you know, uh, critical of the French when this happened saying, oh, look at you, you know, you're so anti-Semitic. Uh, and this is now happening at our doorstep. He said, the Dreyfus affair, that happened with a Jew. This is happening to a Parsi. And um, he's bringing it out and throwing this to the government. Now, George, of course, remember George loved writing. So he also wants to have his say. He writes uh, a piece himself. And you can see, I am innocent, uh, George Adalji, my own story. He writes it in the Pearson's Weekly. And he gives his own his own voice to uh, you know, all the oppression, everything that had happened. So with all this pressure, the Home Office is now forced to appoint a committee to look into the case. The committee then decides to give George a free pardon. So he is acquitted, but there is a twist in the tale. They don't give him any compensation. So Arthur Conan Doyle is furious. He says, either a man is guilty and has to be charged, or if he is innocent, he has to be compensated. So he's now so cross. He says, I'm going to take this a step further. So the next level of investigation begins. And he says, so far, I have worked to prove that George is innocent. Now I'm going to prove who did it. So then we now enter the second phase of his investigation. And once again, he now starts corresponding with Anson. He is so into it. He says, who's written that he starts writing again in the Daily Telegraph? Who wrote the letters? So he writes to Anson. He says, this must be the, the, the instrument. This is drawn by Arthur Conan Doyle. He says, it must have looked like this to make the sort of incisions it did. And then he starts publishing the letters. So in the newspaper, he publishes the copies of the anonymous letters. So this is one written to the police uh, by this person, Greta Rex, uh, who was just a schoolboy. So obviously he didn't write them. They're just written in his name. And he also publishes next to it, a real letter by George himself. So you can see this is New Hall Street, Birmingham solicitor's office, George Adalji, his signature. And he asks the common British public to judge whether you know, these two letters were written by the same person. So Arthur Conan Doyle is appealing. He's trying to get the country behind him. You know, he's become the conscience of the nation and it's, it's his campaign. But of course, he goes on and Anson, it leads to a real clash with Anson. So Anson and Conan Doyle you know, are loggerheads at each other. And when I was researching this book, I found, you know, I accessed the police files and these were letters um, between Conan Doyle and Anson. And you can see how they are clashing, these two gentlemen, you know, Victorian gentlemen at each other's throats. Uh, Anson says Doyle is, he describes him as completely insane and says he should be locked up. And Conan Doyle says, you know, finally uh, sort of pulls the shutters down and says, please do not write to me anymore, write to my solicitor, etc. But what was most intriguing was what I discovered in the police files was that Anson is boasting that he actually lays false trails to trip up Arthur Conan Doyle. And this was incredible. So he uses police money to plant false evidence. So he's really a corrupt cop as well. And it's all um, you know, things that were just being revealed as I was going through these files. So anyway, the case goes on, they keep you know, at loggerheads. And of course, at this moment, you are uh, what you would want to know, did Arthur Conan Doyle solve the case of the Whirly Ripper? He followed the case, he interviewed people, he, you know, he chased leads across the Atlantic. So there were police, he was in correspondence with the police in, in California, it went that far. But of course, did he solve the case? I'm not going to reveal that because you have to read the book, it's a whodunit, and you have to, you know, I'm not going to reveal the ending. 
So, um, but I will tell you uh, what happened to George. Well, thanks to the free pardon, George uh, was reinstated into the solicitor's roles and he could practice again. He, of course, um, he started practicing in London because he said he, he never returned to Great Worthy. And uh, well, I guess, you know, he was quite famous. He would have had clients. <laughs> some might have been put off with his fame. Some might have been attracted to it. Who knows? Uh, but during the Second World War, his office was bombed and, uh, you know, he lost his certificates, his precious certificates and his, his bronze medal. Uh, and then later <clears throat> he went to live with his sister, younger sister Maud. They were always very close. And uh, he lived outside London in a place called uh, Wellin Garden City. Uh, this is a picture of the older George. And, uh, well, I wanted to see... Uh, I knew that George was buried in Welling Garden City in the cemetery and I wanted to find his grave. Uh, but the story of George Idalji had been forgotten over the years. Um, you know, unlike the Dreyfus Affair, which is so famous in French history and has been made into films and has books written on it, George, the case of George Idalji was forgotten. And uh, well, when I went to search for his grave, I just couldn't find it. It was, there were graves, it was, you know, there was nothing there. And I spent four hours looking through gravestones. And finally, this was the last one. And I just had to pull up, you know, it was just covered with weeds. I had to literally pull off all these weeds and uncover this bit. And then I saw this name, Thompson. And then next to it, I saw Edward. And I knew his full name was George Edward Thompson Edalji. And here I faintly was Edalji. So finally, I had found this man's last resting place. And um, I also realized by reading this faint inscription after I pulled off all these weeds that he, uh, his sister Maud was also buried there. So, you know, the, the Idalji family just sort of faded. They had, they didn't marry, um, so they had no children and that was the end of the line. Um, so it was a pretty sad ending for them in, in that sense. Well, but I hope that, you know, now people will know George Adalji and hear his story, because the one thing that he really did, which was important, was that thanks to his case, the law changed. And in 1907, the Criminal Court of Appeal was established in Britain. So he made a major change in law and had an impact. People could now go to a higher court, unlike him, who, you know, he couldn't in his case. So hopefully, um, you know, you would have enjoyed the story and people around have now got to know about George Idalji. So thank you for listening. <laughs> thank you so much, Rabani. It was great. You've taken us through, uh, uh, what, a quarter of a century? <laughs> uh, how did you get interested in this topic, Shrabani? Right. Well, you know, I love writing about these forgotten people in history. It's something I, I really enjoy doing. I'm a journalist. I like finding unknown stories. And, um, you know, my last few books have been, uh, you know, Victoria and Abdul was, yes, nobody yes. heard of Abdul. It was the same thing. Uh, Noor Inayat Khan also is somebody who nobody knew of, though she had won, a, you know, she had been awarded the George Cross. So I knew that uh, the only case, because I'm a, I'm a total other Conan Doyle fan, I love the Sherlock Holmes books. So I knew that he had worked on one case and that was to do with an Indian lawyer. <laughs> so for me, it was like a no brainer. I mean, I had to find out more, uh, but I needed to find out more than what Arthur Conan Doyle has just written about it, which he has done in the Daily, Te you know, in his articles in the Daily Telegraph. So um, it was in 2015, that I, I mean, I was busy with other books, but Idalji was always in my head. I mean, who doesn't want a little mud, you know, a mystery set in an English village? It's like, <laughs> it's like calling out to be written. So um, in 2015, I saw an article in the Times newspaper, which said that some um, letters were coming up for auction. And these were between Arthur Conan Doyle and um, the chief of Staffordshire police. So I knew that, um, there's, there's bound to be something unknown in these boxes. And I followed the auction. I went to the auction room and read the letters. Uh, I could only read a few there and then followed the auction, praying that, you know, it goes into, it doesn't go into a private collection and disappear. But luckily for me, um, it was bought by Portsmouth uh, City Council and their library have a big Arthur Conan Doyle collection. So they acquired it. 
And um, well, I was just applied straight away. I went to see it, um, worked through the files and to the mind of information. And like I said, these little things revealing how the police worked, how prejudiced they were, what Anson was doing, you know, his attitude. Um, he uses the N word to describe uh, George. So it's, it, you know, it just revealed a lot. It also showed Arthur Conan Doyle's passion with the case. Um, plus, of course, I used a lot of other sources. So it took five years <laughs> to write the book. So, so has this case left any lasting imprint on British jurisprudence? Yes, it has, because it changed the law. 1907, it got, uh, it started the criminal court, they started the criminal court of appeal. So it made a big difference because now a convicted criminal could go to a higher court uh, and, you know, once again, an appeal and so on, you know, right till the highest land. So, yeah, it made a big difference. <laughs> so um, can we expect another novel from you on the British Parsi legal connection? Buck <laughs> Huxton, oh, the murderer well. in the 1930s. <laughs> Oh, gosh. Well, let's see. <laughs> it was pretty gruesome doing this case. I don't think this is the first time I've covered uh, something, you know, a criminal offense and uh, examined police files. And they were pretty gruesome. Uh, plus, um, just looking at the attitude was really, really sad. And seeing all these letters in the police files, you know, they are not, I showed some of them, but I got to see all the letters. They really... Um, just thinking of that family, you know, young children receiving these letters and having this sort of oppression with no one to turn to, you know, he was so alone, Shapuji, the father. And uh, so it was, uh, it was quite sad, but all said and done, George fought back, <laughs> you know, kudos to him. He went to Arthur Conan Doyle, <laughs> who would think of doing that? Mark Ruxton's case has also left a similar deep imprint on Mm -hmm. British psyche of that time, of course, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and on Jewish mm -hmm. yeah. uh, uh, You mentioned that Chapuji lived in Kolaba. Would you know where? No, no. Okay. I just know that it was the house was in Kolaba. And uh, in fact, I would love to find, because Chapuji had brothers. You know, he had, a, he had a large family. He had lots of brothers and sisters. And his father's name was Doralji uh, Edalji. So I would love to find, you know, some, there must be adalgies, you know, from that yes. side of the family around. I, I really hope they would contact me. Because Dr. after Alep, the, sorry, yeah, sorry. Sorry, sorry. No, go on. Yeah. There was a mm -hmm. question from Dr. Alep Pathari. Mm -hmm. Were different arguments used by Arthur Conan Doyle to prove George is innocent? Are they available? Um, yeah, so he wrote this, uh, he wrote these detailed articles in the newspaper. And that's, that's his argument, basically. So um, uh, they are available online. You can find them, yes. Uh, I've quoted from them in my book, of course. Uh, but if you want to read the whole thing, yeah, they are, you know, he, if he searches online, he'll find them. And my book has the sources and the links, so he can, they can go to the main thing. Question from Dr. Shubhada Pandya. Why did George not use mm. spectacles? Why did George, sorry? Not use spectacles. You know, they probably, so we are talking about 1892. I mean, glasses probably had come in, but I don't know how advanced that was. Um, or it could be that it didn't correct it enough. So he just didn't wear it. You know, sometimes that does happen. Um, that it's not, there is a problem in the, you know, uh, and it's not correcting it. But later in life, there are photographs of an older George wearing glasses. And uh, so I, I didn't show them here, but I do have those as well. Question from Tala Devi. Are there any descendants now? I think you've addressed them by saying that none of them were married. Well, from, yeah, no. So not from them directly, but, you know, the, they would have had, Shapurji had brothers and sisters, so they would have had cousins. And also I was contacted by somebody after the book came out in England by somebody who is from Charlotte side. So she said she is from the Charlotte side of the family. And they lived near Great Worley. She, you know, knows that that family lived near Great Worley at the time, and she hopes they supported them. And that family went to, uh, they said we went to the grave because we didn't know where he was buried. And they went to the grave and they laid flowers, which is all very nice. <laughs> um, uh, wickers of South Asian origin, I'm sure they're no more uh, very rare in UK at this point in time. Mm -hmm. So how much of the church would, be, would you say is brown or of South Asian origin? 
Um, I couldn't give you an exact number, but yes, I mean, we do have a lot of uh, brown vicars. Uh, there was a, a, vic a he was quite very senior. Uh, he was uh, one of the bishops of one of the churches, Bishop uh, Nazir. Uh, so he was from Pakistan. And uh, there was, so there's a lot of black uh, Asian as well as, uh, you know, uh, black and Asian vicars right now. I couldn't give an exact number, but they, they are visible and they are, they are few. They are there very much. So. Samit wants to know if this case inspired any of Doyle's fictional work. That's really interesting. So I, I did try to find out if he did, but um, the only mention of a Parsi in one of his books is from earlier. And of course, it's a very confused picture because this was the time then, you know, I think they got all the religions mixed up. So the Parsi doesn't have a Parsi name. He has a Sikh name. It's, it's a total mishmash, but he did... Um, I don't think he really used this case again for whatever reason known to him. Uh, but there are lots of um, India related, you know, works by Arthur Conan Doyle, but most of those were pre the George Adalji case. Uh, and of course they're, they're typical, you know, <laughs> it's like the sign of war. So the Indians don't come out very well. They're, they're either bandits or they're, you know, mutineers or bandits and um, killers. So it's all, a, you know, it's a, it's all in the Kipling and the you know in that in that genre of literature at the time. So the great white god, <laughs> absolutely. I'm very influenced by uh, you know Wilkie Collins and the Moonstone. So it's all jewels and bandits and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> Did you have the opportunity to see how this case was covered in the Indian press? Well, I couldn't find any of the newspapers. I did want to see, because there must have been, you know, there would have been, it would, if Nehru saw it here, he saw the coverage here and he wrote to his father, uh, but there must have been some coverage in the Indian media, but it wasn't possible to, you know, find these in the Indian newspapers. But I, I'm, I'm sure there were, if not a extensive like it was here, I'm sure there would have been some coverage of it there. So uh, if it's not confidential, could you tell us what you're working on now for your next book? Oh, well, I'm tinkering with some ideas and okay. uh, let's see how things work out. But taking it a little easy because it was a bit very, very difficult during the lockdown, you know, publishing and uh, finishing the book during the lockdown. I finished it in 2020 when we were all locked down. Um, and so it was it's, it's been hard. But um, and. The libraries are just opening up, so it's a little, you know, access is still difficult. So I'm taking it easy before I sink in to another, another book. Great. We still have about five minutes more. So if anyone wants to ask any questions. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, everybody look for the Adalji family. <laughs> That's my job. Well, I do have a few colleagues who write with me. Mm -hmm. And we are also Adalji's, but they're based in Hyderabad, but no harm in asking. No harm in asking, spread, spreading the word. So the father's name for those, uh, you know, Shapurji's father, the, the original Adalji in, in Kolaba was Doralji. Uh, Doralji Adalji. Well, we have his name as Doralji, but Dora, Doralji is not really a name. It's, it should have been Doralji. Dorabji. Dorabji, yeah. exactly. So um, I have used what it is, but, you know, what they've registered him as, but I think it was probably Dorabji. Dorabji. So he should have been Dorabji Adalji. Lived in Kolaba. <laughs> Son was called Shapuji Adalji. And yes, we spread the word around and tried to locate them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they could be anywhere around the world, really, yeah. but uh, it would be fun. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time, Shravani. It was great traversing 25 years of uh, history with you. Mm -hmm. A pleasure. Thank you for accepting our invitation. And thank you, audience, for uh, being with us. See you, everybody. Bye and have a nice weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.